Out there, welcome. My name is Laulu Akonde, and you are on to Inside Sources. First, let us rejoice over the victory of Super Eagles this week as they head all the way to the finals of the African Cup of Nations. This is such a very exciting moment for Nigeria, and you can see me wearing green. Let's support our team all the way and show the world that Nigeria is on top of our game. Not only in soccer, hopefully, even in our national life. Now, to my take for the week. There is hunger in the land. We are seeing the expressions of frustrations and despair on the streets, even on social media. The security challenges in the country are festering. And yes, we have seen a few notable moves by the federal government, especially trying to deal with these problems. In the states where the real actions are, there is very little focus. Everyone is looking onto Abuja. Now, that has to change, but that is an issue for another day. But why should we always wait up until the boiling point before we attempt to do the needful? For instance, when the federal government removed oil subsidy, everybody knew that there would be consequences. But we waited until the people started feeling the pangs without any immediate succor. Why did we wait? We see how long it is taking us to get more policemen to meet up with the required global standard for effective policing to deal with our insecurity challenges. How long will it take us to hire the right number of cops? How long? I remember that there was an additional 10,000 cops that were hired, but that is far too below. Why do we always wait until the boiling point to act? We are still waiting to comprehensively deal with the issue of police welfare. Their welfare affects their output. Why are we waiting to pay the police decent wages? take care of the accommodation properly so that they can be inspired to work. Why are we waiting? Why don't we have enough troops in all of our security agencies when we know that for decades now we have been dealing with serious issues of insecurity? Why has the number of our troops not significantly improved to reflect the realities of what we are dealing with? Why should we wait till we have protests in Kano and, and Niger and other places before government starts to set up an emergency presidential committee, such as the one that was done in the villa a few days ago, which was set up to deal with the situation? Could it be we were taken by surprise that prices are skyrocketing in the market and we didn't expect it? Why do we always wait till desperation and despair are on the streets before we act? We already know, for instance, that we are dealing with inflation and that this is a global problem and that we are dealing with food insecurity as farmers can farm because of insecurity. Why do we always wait to take knee-jerk reactions and then we go back to business as usual? And that's the point today. This is why coordination of government efforts is a big deal. Mr. President, you need to put your foot down on the issue of effective coordination. You need to insist that the activities of government is properly coordinated, properly done. Somebody, for instance, should have sounded the alarm long time ago. Taking knee-jerk reactions is an indication that there is no coordination, or at least no effective coordination. If our president and the governors can become more proactive in dealing with the challenges, then that will be a game changer. Mr. President, governors, that is the way to go. All of this is happening under your watches and you have the opportunity to change it now. Let government be more proactive to deal with our problems. Don't wait until we reach boiling point. We hope that the committees that have been set up and all the other measures that are being put in place will yield results but our message today is that we know what the problems are. We know the problems that exist. So we need to always act 
ahead of the problem. Let us deal with all these issues so that we can reduce social tension. Let's show that we know what we are dealing with and let us try to ameliorate, reduce or prevent some of the avoidable pains and sufferings which the mass majority of our people are going through at this point. And that is my take for this week. Inside Sources will be right back. Welcome back. Today I have a distinguished professor of international law, somebody who is a well-known legal luminary, a senior advocate of Nigeria, and who was the chairman of the Presidential Advisory Committee Against Fighting Corruption in the last administration. The one and only, I, I dare say, Professor Isejua Sage. Professor Sage, you're welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to, to speak to you. Thank you so much. So the first question that I ask, you know, around this conversation on the future of Nigeria uh, is what I'm going to put to you right away, Prof. If you look at where Nigeria is today, right now, would you say that our country is on a trajectory that will deliver that Nigeria of, of great hope, that great Nigeria that we all dream about. Do you think we are on the trajectory to get there? Prof. Um, the man in charge and those appointed under him are great strategic people the immediacy and the sudden, uh, the, the, the sudden manner in which this, particularly the decision to remove uh, uh, petrol, um, what do you call it? Subsidy. Uh, subsidy. All those, the suddenness of all that has created an immediate um, level of hardship, which is almost becoming unbearable. But if you look at it as a whole, the whole prospect of the country, if you look at the men in charge, there are people who know what they are doing. I have faith in them. And I believe that as time goes on, the pressure on Nigerians will ease, the hardship will, will decrease, and uh, we'll be in a much better position than we're in now. Okay. So, so, so if, if I ask you to be more categorical, you will say that we are on course. Yes, we are on course. I, I am not in full agreement about the order in which some of the things being done now uh, have been brought out. On the issue of petroleum, particularly petrol itself, I would have been happier if the government had been patient to allow internal production to commence before removing the subsidy. They should have allowed the internal production to commence. I, now, Dangote I, as, is now producing, although I understand deliberately withholding the petrol, which is the first uh, commodity that comes out of the production line. I don't know why this is so. And of course, uh, the, 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 the one in Port Harcourt is virtually ready. And so perhaps if we had waited a little longer, the transition would not have been so harsh. But we're in it already. I think we're in competent hands and eventually I believe we'll get out. So all told, yes, I'm satisfied with what the, what the government is doing because the policies are based on experience and knowledge of the various areas uh, involved. Mm. All right, so, so Prof, uh, th thank you, thank you. Let, let, let's get uh, a little bit uh, deeper into some of the issues that you've raised. Now, so, so, so you said that you would have preferred a situation where 
uh, regards to the removal of fuel subsidy that yes. uh, internal, uh, you know, a local production of uh, refined crude. We've been on this subsidy for decades. And a few more months would not have killed us. Uh, I mean, you can see the difference in lifestyle now. Uh, petrol was selling for, I think, 167. It's now 600. And uh, there are some people in the trade who are now even threatening us with the price increasing to 1,000. I mean, that, that's unacceptable. Mm. So, and uh, w w what we have seen is that the question of the price of petrol is critical to our lives mm. because all this extreme hardship, cost of living going up, food particularly going up 300%, and so many other things becoming uh, so difficult to, to acquire for mm. basic living, I think we might have just gone on for another six months or so. And then as internal production was coming in, the subsidy would have been eased out gradually. Mm. You know, those in the field, well, what I'm saying so is that those in the field have always assured us that the cost of the subsidy, what, what, what the government was providing through the subsidy was the cost of transportation, to overseas to collect the refined product, mm. uh, the port charges, a little um, taxes here and there, about five different payments which had to be made. And all this will be eliminated if production is internal. And my argument is that once you remove all these costs from the trade, then we should have been able to either retain the subsidized price or just you know, gone up a little higher, maybe at maximum of 300. We could have waited for a few months for that. That's my personal view, yeah. but that's not reality anymore. Right. The government has taken a decision. We all have to abide by it, even support them because they are working towards something uh, much more beneficial for the whole country. So we put that behind and hope for the best because we are being uh, served by competent men in their various fields. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. So, so just one more issue before we move along from that. It, 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 you, you spoke about, you know, the problems with, uh, you know, the, the fallout of the removal of the oil subsidy and, of course, the issue of uh, food inflation and prices, you know, uh, there has been so much lately, expressions of hunger on social media all over the place. Is there something that you would like to, uh, to, to say to the, uh, to the government, particularly Mr. President, that can be done, that you think can be done to alleviate particularly the, the problem of the prices uh, of, of food? I could say a few things, but some of them may not be economically um viable correct or wise things like subsidizing food again you know so i i don't really want to introduce that but i we, palliatives are being given to those who are desperately in need um we already we have uh, um, the money transfer to the poorest of the poor i think those things are being done already mm. uh, although the ministry is in some trouble I was already linked to this government when all these um, social uh, needs development uh, pro, uh, social investment yes provisions were were, were made and I, and I saw the impact that it made you know, the training of young people in various professions providing money for the needy providing school lunch those are very good good um, policies which uh, Nigerians have enjoyed and which they appreciate. I think we should keep them and just uh, push the government to work harder so that the impact of his new policies will begin to come in. Mm. I think one thing that we have to watch particularly now, which really makes me extremely worried, is the value of the Naira. Mm. 
we, there must be a stop to this deterioration. You know, almost every week, we have almost a, a hundred uh, naira depreciation, if not worse. And I, I never dreamt that there would be a time that we'll be having uh, a relationship of naira to dollar, one thousand naira to one dollar. It, it, it just has to stop. I don't know what the government has to do. Mm. It has to stop. Otherwise, it will destroy everything that the government is trying to do. Mm. Well, yeah, to, to, to your point about the, the Naira, the, the central bank governor actually has spoken up and we've seen quite a, uh, a few uh, uh, measures rolled out in the last uh, several days and hopefully you know, we'll be able to control that. You know, we are all concerned. Uh, the last time it was changing for, you know, almost about 1,500 uh, uh, Naira. But let's move along, uh, Prof, to, to a terrain that you are more familiar with. Since we're talking about the future of Nigeria, what are the major judicial reforms that, that you would like to see? Um, and I ask that question against quite a few backgrounds. I'll, I'll let you pick uh, yeah, the, the, your, your own choices. Now, against the background of the, uh, the, 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 the involvement and the role that the that, that judiciary now plays in, in election outcomes. That's, that's one big uh, background. That's also the issue of, you know, how judges are appointed. So, so clearly, you know, the judiciary uh, has quite a lot of things that we want to see reformed. But I will just ask you, and I want you to just take the lead. What are the areas of judicial reforms that you think we should prioritize as a people, as a nation? Yes. Um, of course, the issue of appointments is, is critical. Um, in recent years, there's been a tendency for only, or not only, but mainly relations of those who are already in the judiciary, particularly the higher ups, to be appointed into the judiciary. We've had too many cases of this inbreeding mm. going on, and uh, it was becoming a scandal. I think the public outcry will probably reduce this malady. It was, it was just becoming too much. Right? There's no need to list the various cases that have been, uh, that's, that are well known. That, but that, that's not the major thing. My major issue with the judiciary in the last 10 years or so is that it has lost the glory which was brought on it by the great names in the period we call the golden age of the Supreme Court. We're talking of people like Kayode Esho, Oputa, um, quite a number of, uh, a, large, a large number of them. Um, I'm just trying to think of. Does those, this those are the things that I can think of. But well, they were the leaders of the group. And um, basically what they were doing, which made them so great, was that they did not look at the technicality of the law as such. Mm -hmm. their, their aim was the achievement of justice. And what, what they did was that when every mat any matter came before them, they would ask themselves, where does the justice of this case lie? Based on that, once they decided that, then the law that they will apply will favor that direction. Some people may say, oh, this will result in um, unsteadiness of the law, uncertainty of the law. No. Where the law is absolutely certain and it's applied directly without any other philosophy, it always results in injustice. Mm. So, they said it over and over again. First is justice. Where does the justice lie? That's, that's number one. That's what made them great. I will remember the other names. 
uh, during the course of this interview. Mm. That's number one. Number two, they were very, very bold. These are the things I want the present uh, judicial judiciary to adopt. They were very bold. Even in the military era, they gave decisions against the military government, even against the military government of Buhari, which was the harshest we ever had. For example, there was a case of this gentleman in charge of fire service in Lagos, who was being accused of not being sufficiently uh, uh, bold and, uh, and proactive when the, that um, headquarters of, of, of uh, the postal yeah, net. and the, the net yes. building in Lagos. The net building, yes. And they, without proper inquiry, he was suspended and then dismissed from service. He went to court, they arrested him because the government policy did not allow that. And the matter came to, came to the court. This arrest, the dismissal, and so on. And it was based on a decree at that time, which was passed by the Buhari government, that you cannot question the government if you are retired. And the, after it, he, he had failed in the High Court, failed in the Court of Appeal, when he got to the Supreme Court, and this is what I call not only justice, but um, it, a sense of uh, capacity to, to think and, and think beyond bad law. What, what they said was that mm. this so-called offense occurred in 1983. I think April or May. Buhari came to government, uh, came to power 31st December 1983. Therefore, he cannot make any law that will apply to a period in which his government did not exist. Therefore, that law, as applied to that gentleman, was totally illegal. That's, that was the sort of reason Buhari was in power. That was that courage. Was yes, courage and, and, and a good philosophy and uh, a, a sense of mission to do justice because the man was unjustly punished. Mm. Then there was the Ojuku case where Ojuku was thrown out of his father's house because the Lagos State government seized all the houses of people uh, who had escaped or left Lagos during the Civil War. Mm. He went and reoccupied his house in Lagos. Soldiers were sent to throw him out. He was thrown out. He went to court. He lost on the High Court. Then Court of Appeal said he should be restored to the house, that the law which uh, under which the house was seized was illegal. The military government refused and instead appealed to the Supreme Court against the decision of the Court of Appeal. And, and the Supreme Court said, you cannot appeal to us whilst you are disobeying a court order. And so they threw out the appeal. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. Mm. I, I have so many examples Cases. of that. I don't want to yeah. drag on. These people had not only philosophy, the courage, they wanted justice. That, that was it crucial thing. They wanted justice. This is lacking now. Mm. I'm afraid. What, what, what is coming back. Yes, it's lacking. That's the first thing they have to do mm. to recover what they have lost, to go back to the golden age. What, what do you think probably is responsible for the, 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 the scenario you just painted? What, you know, the, the lack of courage and the, 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 the preference for technicality over, over issues of justice. What do you think is responsible for that? What happened? I, I, well, I, I think um, we have sort of succumbed to material considerations and uh, uh, exercise less courage than, than, uh, than we used to be. Well, but what I've discovered is that a court that is highly principled need fear nothing. And that high moral courage is so powerful that the most powerful military machine will obey it. That's what I found in practice. But once they see that you don't have that courage, that uh, your level of, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, of, of 
I want, don't want to say morality, but let me still use the word courage. Is low. That is when the, the military or even government, the the administer the uh, executive, will tend to exercise power in an unruly manner. Mm. Mm. You know, so they respect principles. They respect those who are principled and who are firm and just. And I want that to come back. That's the major thing that is missing mm. now, right now. Yeah, very important point, but I'd I, I like to, us to stay, stay on it. So will you agree, uh, Prof, that uh, this is not symptomatic only of the judiciary? Will you agree to the notion that there has been a general decline in values uh, you know, in, in, our, in our nation? And, uh, you know, if, if you agree, do you think that is what, you know, uh, describes the scenario that you've painted? A general decline of values? Absolutely. I've always said it, right? I'm of the, of the age, of an age in which I have seen all the governments of this country. And I can judge. The First Republic, when I was still in school, uh, secondary and then university. Um, probably the best we've ever had. Those men, the Awolawas, the Tafawa Balewas, the Amadu Bellos, and their cohorts served this country without any consideration of material gain at all. In fact, they regarded the service of the country as a privilege. Mm. And they were, they were very proud servants of Nigeria. And they were highly principled. And you can see that most of the development, to you economists can go and check me out. Most of the developments we have enjoyed in Nigeria, the highest level of development we've enjoyed in Nigeria is during that period, the period leading to independence and the first six years after independence. Since then, there has been a severe decline because of a decline of human character. Mm. There's been a decline of human character. With every succeeding generation of Nigerian politicians, the character of the set of rulers has gone in a greater decline. So that, that, that is... So I agree with you. It's not only the judiciary. This, this is general. This can be well documented. Mm. Just compare various uh, regimes, various um, republics, mm. and you will see that we have been declining. I have not yet to pass judgment on the current um, government. The Buhari government tried to pull us out by introducing a few things, and including uh, PACAC, which I, which I, I headed. Mm. And a lot was done at that time. But remove that, the quality of those ruling us. I'm not thinking only of the executive. I'm thinking particularly of the legislature. That one is particularly bad. Uh, that's where our worst deficit has occurred. Mm. Okay, Prof. So, uh, I mean, so you are an head of statesman, you know, uh, you are a professor of law, you are a senior advocate of Nigeria, uh, and you are, in your, you are in your 80s. Now, yes. so, so if we are to have a whole society approach to, reach, to, 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 to sort out, to, to, to resolve these challenges, this uh, drop in, uh, in the character index, if we could use that word, or, or decline in, in values. You know, if we're going to have a, an whole society approach, you know, which is even, it, go, it goes beyond government, what are those things that you think have to happen? Or at least, you know, how do you think we can wriggle our way out of this, uh, what some people would call uh, a, a morass? That's a very difficult question because 
I've studied the character of Nigerians, including myself, so I, I, I don't exclude myself you know, from the blame. Um, we like strong governments, strong administration with harsh punishments. Hmm. That's what Nigerians love. In order to comply both in terms of morality and legality uh, with the norms of society, with the provisions of our laws. It, I want to use that Buhari example again. You know when, when they were in power and uh, they banned quite a number of things. For example, they introduced having to line up uh, very, very neatly and, uh, and uh, diligently in order to get into buses and other things, not to rush. That was immediately adopted and it became part of our culture. The same thing with dropping refuse and so on on the roads and so on. Once they introduced it, because of the consequences and the punishments which they inflicted, Nigeria became a very disciplined society. People were putting rubbish into bins rather than spilling them all over the place. Mm. And I'm just giving those two examples. Generally, all right, I to give a third example. I come to, to the courts. Now, our court system is terrible. Uh, not even the judges now who have their own separate problem. The registry, on, until I stopped going to court a few years ago, when you get there, you want to file anything, you must have a lot of change in your pocket. At every stage, you are paying money. Every stage of the process of filing a case, of hearing a case, after the case of obtaining judgment, Oh, you are paying a lot of money. And, and these, are not, these are not receipted monies, uh, Prof? Absolutely not receipted. Absolutely not receipted. There are other things that are happening. Uh, everything connected with the judiciary, the non, the, 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 the administrative people there who are carrying out things are taking money left, right, and center. And people have to pay to have services judicial services carried out, legal services carried out, they have to pay. So that uh, this did not happen. Under Buhari, I remember a case in which um, somebody in the registry was being given money in the routine way it is done for work to be done. And the fe fellows just raised his hands and said, please, for God's sake, save me from trouble. I'm not taking anything from anybody. Everybody was afraid of doing that, but now it's just casual. If you don't, you don't move. Mm. That's a problem. Excellent. Thank you so much. Final question, uh, which is uh, still on the issue of education and you know what happened, what happens uh, in the universities, particularly. I remember uh, that it, sometimes in the eighty in the eighties, you were an active member of the of ASU. Uh, so 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 you are not unfamiliar with uh, ASU. So I want to ask you. Do you think that it is worth the why for ASU to go on strike for as long as eight months, as we have seen uh, recently, Prof? It was terrible. The ASU of our time was not like that. Yes, we must struggle, we must fight, we must take all steps possible to deal with government and obtain the highest level of reward and benefits for our people. I, there's no doubt about that. But when you decide to go on strike, not only must it be in a very extreme case, it, it, surely it should not last for more than a month at the highest. What ASU did last, going on for eight months, for me, was a total abandonment mm. of the spirit of ASU, of, of, the, of the culture of ASU, of what ASU stands for, which basically is uplifting the level of education and learning in this country. It abandoned it for purely personal and wanting uh, uh, 
love of 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 money. It, it was a, a most embarrassing thing and and very destructive for the future education of this country. No, I don't. I, I didn't support it. I was very sad. I was very sad, and I'm glad that Asu did not break the, the government's will in this case because if that had happened, then the next time they'll go on for two years. Mm. But I'm glad that in the end they came back and negotiated and are now getting some benefits which they demanded without necessarily getting everything. But that's the way it used to be. That's the way it should be. We can't get everything we want. But we must always remember that we are a critical sector in the development and survival of the country. We are a privileged group being given training, being given qualifications and standing in society. We have a lot to pay back and must not be extreme in our demands or be so stubborn and difficult that we wreck the whole edifice and the whole system which we've been trained to bring up just because of filthy lucre. Mm. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for your views. Um, I, I'm encouraged that uh, you believe that we are on the right course and uh, you know, knowing that you are also progressive minded, I hope that uh, those who are in power today, uh, they will take your encouragement very seriously and do what it takes to put us uh, right in, 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 in touch with that great Nigeria that we all uh, dream about. Thank you so much, Prof, uh, for coming onto Inside Sources. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you, sir. Welcome back. For this segment, we want to have a quick discussion on the Safe School Initiative. As we have all seen, uh, the issue of the kidnap and abduction of school children is still prevalent. Only recently, uh, about last week, there was the uh, kidnapping of uh, some school children in a kitty. Uh, good thing they have been released. To discuss what the federal government is doing on the issue of safe school, we have uh, the national coordinator of the financing safe school project, Hajia Alima Ibrahim, uh, with us in Inside Sources. Hajia, you are welcome to Inside Sources. Thank you very much for having me. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, so let's just start from what happened recently in AKT. Uh, and that's just one example. Uh, so so I, 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 I reckon that sometimes in 2014, uh, the federal government, along with some of the development partners and the state governors, I believe, uh, came to uh, the conclusion of having what we know to be the Safe School Initiative. Now, I want to ask you, what has been the impact of this initiative, you know, amidst some, some of the abductions and the kidnappings of school children that we continue to see in our country? Thank you very much for that question. Um, I would like to share more light to that. Um, actually, the Safe Schools Initiative was launched in 2014 as a result of the adoption of the Chubo girls and the incidents attack on education, where 276 girls were actually kidnapped. Mm. So the Safe Schools Initiative was launched, introduced for that to address the issue at hand, to be able to support the victims of attacks to continue with their education unhindered. So what we have presently is Safe Schools Project. So the Safe School Project, in 2019, the federal government signed the Safe School um, ratification document, signaling the country's commitment to its implementation, where we have about 118 member countries that have signed to that declaration. That's the Safe School Declaration. The Safe School Declaration. That shows a commitment of the country because it's a document, it's a declaration, it's an agreement that was actually signed. And it's an international and declaration. It's an international declaration where we have 118 member countries. And along the line, the issue of attacks on education was reoccurring for stakeholders. Mm. So in 20, 
2021, following the declaration, the Federal Ministry of Finance convened a high-level meeting where we had um, Golden Brown, we had the national and the subnationals, mm -hmm. we had the um, development partners. We had it was a high-level meeting to chart a way forward on how to address this menace. So the federal government, it was agreed in that meeting to develop for Ministry of Finance to develop a compact, to develop a costed plan. As a country without a plan, <laughs> we've not started. Mm. So we developed a, a financing plan. That is why you're having the project in finance is an initiative of Ministry of Finance to create innovative sources of funding to address the issues of attacks on education. So basically, it's supporting Ministry of Education, supporting the social sector by way of providing a model and innovative sources of funding. So along the line in 2022, the, um, the federal government was, um, you know, the Ministry of Finance was assigned with that responsibility. Okay. So we pulled stakeholders from... Um, relevant government agencies to develop the safe schools plan. Right. So in 2022, we had the Nigerian Governors Forum as a member of the technical working group. We have um, the Department of State Services, that is MDSS. Mm. We have Defense. We have Ministry of Education. We have um, Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. Okay. And um, we have other supporting MDAs. This shows collaboration and synergy at the subnationals and the national level. So we have Ministry of Women Affairs who is supporting MDAs. They are right now even working on developing a plan for the victims of attack in line with the national plan. Mm. So in the same year, by December, between October and November, Nigeria hosted the first Safe School Declaration Conference the fourth in the world and the first in Africa was hosted in Nigeria. Last year? Yeah, that was in 2021. By 2022, okay. by 2022, we launched the national plan. So by 2023, we commenced full implementation of the national plan. The national plan has a total investment size of 144.8 billion. So we intend to see how we can you know, um, get funding through the federal, states, and local government, which is a, a unique plan on its own. Looking at the three tiers of government, the commitment of government coming together to address the mm. issue. So the plan was actually launched and um, implementation commenced in 2023 by the flag of, of the National Safe Schools Response Coordination Center in February at the mm. NSCDC headquarters being the lead agency for government critical assets. So we flag of the re response center and the, the unique thing is the response center is being manned by all the security agencies. So where, where is the, the response center based? It's based in the NSCDC um, complex, the NSCDC yeah. office in Abuja. in Abuja. So it's a coordination center. We intend to replicate the same at the state level. Of course, some of the state governors has already buy into it and they have provided facility for state response center so, so that will be, be linked to the national, national response so, so center. So there, there will be response mm. centers in each of the states. Yes, that absolutely. will be connected to the national response center. Yes, yes, Okay, so, so right. let, let me just ask. Uh, so the, the children that were uh, kidnapped on January 29 in Ekiti, they were inside the school bus you know, when the incident happened. When this National Response Center is fully operational, how would it be helpful to that kind of a scenario? Yes, for me, this is the time that security of schools have become business for everybody. We are all stakeholders. The plan has, um, has a whole society approach. Mm. So looking at that, we have to use our thinking cap we have to be innovative. We have to think outside the box. The government cannot do everything for us. We have to also contribute our quota. But I think personally what we should do is 
as it is mandatory for children to carry ID card in schools. Right. This is an option. We could have a chips on the ID card. This is digital age. Right. And um, if anything, when you see something, you say something. Right. You can just press your ID card and it signals the response center. And since you have securities that are manning those centers, you have um, the okay. response agencies, you also have protective agencies. So they know who to call when that distress call comes in mm. for so quick response. That, that, would mm. be, so that, that, that would be an exciting option if that were to, 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 mm. to, to happen. So the private sector, I mean, the private schools can actually do that for their students, while government would uh, can partner with the private sector to, to support the government in that regard. So we need to look into that aspect because um, you never can tell. It's something that you cannot predict. Mm. And sometimes the kidnaps are even organized crime by insiders. But when you have something, not just ID card, you could have something anywhere, mm. a chips that you can send signals to response centers. We intend to have at the state level and the local government level. Interesting. So, so mm. all the students, wherever they are, they will be able to uh, make an alert. Absolutely. You know. Now, do you think that, uh, Absolutely. Do, you, do you know when this is going to start happening? Well, if you look at the, the issues at hand, um, even the schools that we have, I think we have about 16, 160,000 schools. That is the formal centers and the non-formal sector, pretty above that number. You mean 160,000 schools all, all yes, across the country, yes, total? Yes, yes, Thereabouts, okay. Um, about, thereabouts, and uh, slightly above that number. Okay. I don't want to be specific mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with figures. So um, it's, it's, it's a project that it's very, I would not say it's complex, but is a project that requires support from every angle. Mm. It's a massive project. Right. We, we, we are soliciting for the support of the state government to be able to take ownership and to be responsible to take responsibility of this Safe Schools project. And um, so far, so good. Mm. We have interacted with some of the governors and um, for the very first time, they have made a commitment in the 2024 budget, which is quite interesting. That's the state government. The state government, yes. Um, like Benue State, Plateau State, Bochi State, Berlo State, and a few others have already made commitment in the 2024 budget. That's, that's in their that states. That is a funding commitment for states. In yes. their states, there. But, yes. but there's also the new story uh, that the that this safe school initiative or safe school project was not included in the 2024 budget of the federal government. What about, what happened to that? Well, actually in 2023, the safe school project was um, given 15 billion as takeoff. And for 2024, some of these agencies, implementing agencies have included in their budget that's the agency's budget and for those that have not we're still working closely it's work in progress to ensure that they get adequate funding from the federal government and the good thing is the federal government has bought into it because if you look at the renewed hope um, agenda for mr president he emphasized on education and security so i know this is something that the government is ready to invest mm. in. Yeah, Hajia, can, can, can you look into the high of the Nigerian children in school and say that the federal government is working on this thing? You know, this kind of stuff is going to be, it's going, it's going to be reducing. Are you, are you that confident? I am very, very much confident. I am passionate to drive this to the level that we want the safe schools a project. I'm ready to work very hard to be able to get to that promised land. Mm -hmm. And the federal government is supporting. The federal government is committed. And um, if you look at the how we started the safe schools, we have a very good model mm. in terms of uh, coming up with the plan. I attended the United Nations Security Council meeting of the UNOWAS. 
after we made our presentation. What, 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 what that is um, United the, the Nations for the Sahel and um, West Africa and Sahel region. Okay. Yes. So the we made United a United Nation office. For yes, the West office Africa. for the West African and the Sahel. Sahel right. mm -hmm. So we actually made a presentation as a country and. Um, it was a fantastic presentation because Nigeria is the only country that has come up mm. with a national plan, not just a national plan, but innovative sources of funding, looking at the problem on a more holistic and sustainable basis. Interesting. And, um, you know, it became a reference for uh, many countries. Okay. And um, we're a member of the implementation um, network where you have the Norway, Argentina, the Global Coalition, and they're all looking, you know, trying to see, they've been sending emails, what is Nigeria doing, mm. um, what are the, you know, success stories, what is government doing um, in mm. terms of assuring implementation of the national plan. And exactly. um, the good thing is we're positive about it and, and we shall get there. We're making efforts and very soon the Nigerian police and the defense, because um, we cannot really measure the impact. It's, it's something that you see gradually. Mm. It's a gradual thing because due to the funding, right. they could not access their funding timely in 2023. But what, hopefully what, what was that? that was um, talking about the implementing agencies. So it slows down some of the, you know, um, activities for the Safe Schools project. But I and know... Why, 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 were they, why were they not able to assess their funding? Their funding. We all know what the country, the challenge the country is mm. facing regarding paucity of resources. Okay. And, um, you know, when you allocate, you have to really weigh it. Mm to see how much you give out. And um, obviously you can't give what you don't have. Mm. Yeah, so, but um, we're working and they have, at the end of the day, they're being funded. Okay. And before end of first quarter, the Nigerian police and the defense would um, very soon unveil their activities. Okay, um, excellent. So, so are, you, are you convinced that the, the stakeholders, Nigerian police, the NSEDC, and uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, DSS, uh, who I imagine are members of the National Response Team. Are you, are you convinced that everything is set up, you know, at least in the National Center, uh, the Response Center, are you convinced that they are, they, are, they are ready to do the job and they are sufficiently resourced to do the job? Like I have mentioned earlier, um, we just started implementation last year. Okay. It's still work in progress as we're proceeding because we're, because the problem is urgent as you can see yeah it is urgent it is it is urgent i agree with you and um there are a lot of sensitization going on across the the six geopolitical zones mm -hmm. and even the training of the security agencies it's very paramount we're looking at strengthening um detection deterrence mm -hmm. and response um for these um, response capabilities of the security agencies. Right. So a lot of trainings have been going on and, um, you know, it's ongoing. And, uh, you know, they're trying to see because it's coming new to them, the security right. of schools and mm. uh, what we are experiencing. Although government has been responding from every state, you could see the response of government right from 2024. Right. But to see how they can work in synergy and proper coordination. Okay. And uh, which we also reached out to the NSC's office to coordinate the operations of the security agencies. Excellent. Okay, mm. last question. Since this is uh, an international uh, declaration, and I think it is uh, under the auspices of the UN, uh, are, are there going to be uh, uh, some international funding, you know, or support, or is it just going to be the Nigerian government, uh, state, and local that will be funding the project? Yes, there's going to be international funding because if you look at the way the plan is being designed, we have um, the funding gaps is coming from the private sector, it's coming from donor agencies, philanthropists, it's coming from international um, partners. We'll ride on some success or some inf existing infrastructure of the World Bank where they have, uh, like the Agile project, for instance. The what? 
Agile project. Like the Agile. adolescent, yes, okay. yes. Okay. So they have a component for scholarship. So we, what we want to do is I have, um, I'm trying to reach out to the coordinator to have a discussion with them. Mm. To see how we can support children from volatile location, children that are out of schools. We have some, especially in the Northwest, mm. you have schools that have been shut down for decades, for years. So we mm. have children that are out of school to see how we can move them and enroll them into Unity Colleges for continuing of education. So we've even sent a template out. In the last technical meeting now, we heard with the partners, we have designed a template and we've sent it out to the states to furnish us with information of those children, data of those children right. that are out of school to see how we can um, you know, enroll them into school for continuity of education, which is in line Wait, with uh, the national plan. Right. So the role of finance is to provide funding and to ensure implementation of the national plan. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Haji Alima. Uh, we will uh, keep an eye on, on the progress of this uh, important assignment, you know, mm. and I'm personally excited with, the, with that digital alert plan that mm. can be a game, game changer and we wish uh, we wish you and the entire people trying to secure our schools uh, uh, all the best. And thank you so much. And I must thank you all for all the massive feedback that we have been receiving, especially regarding our last week edition. We've received a lot of emails, a lot on the social media, a lot even by phone calls. We appreciate those comments and please keep them coming. Now we have an official X Andu, which is Inside Sources 01, at Inside Sources 01, and also on the email, it is Inside Sources Official at gmail.com. Send me all the comments, and I will be reading some of the comments at the end of the show. And thank you very much for watching. My name is Laulu Akonde.